All right, I'd like to call the Spokane City Council briefing session to order for today. And uh, we'll take the roll in just a moment, but just to remind people that we did uh, advance what very little we had on our legislative agenda uh, for tonight to this afternoon's meeting, which is still pretty small. Uh, but let's have a roll call from the clerk. Here. Councilmember Burke. Here. Councilmember <coughs> Cathcart. Present. Councilmember Kinnear. Present. Councilmember Stratton. Or excuse me, Councilmember Mum. Sorry about that. That's okay. Here. Councilmember Stratton. Here. Councilmember Wilkerson. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, and we'll go to the advance agenda for November 23rd. Thank you, Council President. Uh, we'll start with the consent agenda for next week. And first up is a presentation of the Spokane Airport Board 2021 budget. And Larry Crowder and Dave Armstrong from Spokane Airports are present to, are here to present this item. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ormsby. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, we uh, have had the opportunity to speak with many Council members uh, with regard to the proposed 2021 operating and capital budgets. I know we have a couple more conversations planned uh, before next Monday. Um, I'll turn it over to Dave just to uh, hit the highlights again, recognizing that uh, most of you have uh, had the information presented to you. So we'll stay very brief on the highlights and happy to answer any questions, of course, that Council has. Dave? Thank you, Mr. Crowder, and um, thank you, uh, City Council. Um, the 2021 budget for the Consolidated Operating Groups, Spokane International Airport, the airport business park and felt field. The total annual budget is 80. Let me get to my slide here. The total budget is 81 million four hundred sixty-six thousand and twenty-two dollars, which represents an eight and a half percent decrease from the 2020 budget. That included in that is 39 million. $21,022 in the operating budget, which represents 15.7% decrease from 2020, and our capital budget of $42,445,000, which is a small decrease of nine tenths of a percent. Um, we were able to uh, put together a budget for 2021 based on a staffing model of approximately 1 million employments, and in the budget, uh, book that is included in the uh, advanced packet for you is estimates as to what we see passengers for 2021. And that's roughly 50% of what we had in 2019. 2020 will end up approximately that same level, 50% decline in passengers. We have found out in analysis here at Spokane International that approximately 85% of our operating expenses are fixed. And that shows throughout the entire uh, budget book presentation. But where we were able to reduce expenses was in staffing. And we have reduced our staff to reflect approximately an airport with a million employments. And that took out roughly 17% of our staffing model. Over $2 million we took out of our staffing budget. Uh, we were able to reduce other costs in our parking operation by consolidating some lots that we were then able to get as close as we could to the terminal so we would not have to be running our shuttles and not have to be removing snow and de-icing uh, surface lots uh, on the airport. That took out another significant amount of costs in our operating budget. We were able to reduce some utilities by obviously shutting down some of those lots. We're, we're reducing repairs and maintenance. We have reduced our third party contractors significantly. Those were the areas that we were able to reduce the 2021 budget in the operating portion of it. Our capital budget is approximately the same as 2020, mainly because of the funding mechanisms. 
Our operating budget is funded by the people who actually use the airport. It's our parking rents, tenant rents, our agreements with the airline partners where they pay tenant rents and landing fees, our concessionaires like the rental car companies, our food and beverage. Um, all of those fees come to the airport through people who use the airport. We don't get any programmed funding from either the city or the county through uh, tax revenues. Uh, our capital program is funded totally differently. It comes from uh, this year we've got a fairly large build grant from uh, or 2021. We have a fairly large build grant from the United States Department of Transportation. We have TSA funding. We have the airport improvement program funding. These are all federal funds. We have some funding already in place for projects at the rental car facility, which comes from another facility charge uh, to rental car uh, users. We have funding from passenger facility charges, and we have projects associated with that in 2021. And the last piece is approximately $8.4 million of a combination of airport funds and our CARES funds. And we have earmarked some of those funds to be used for our capital program. So capital program is very similar to 2020. So in summary, the actual budget has been reduced eight and a half percent. And again, we come to the city council and we will visit with the county commissioners also based on the interlocal agreement that we need to present the budget and have the budget approved by both of our uh, sponsor partners, the city and the county of Spokane. And that basically summarizes the 34 page document. And we'll take any questions if we have any. And as Larry said, we have been able to meet with many of the council members in the past couple weeks. I see Mr. Cathcart's yep. hand is up. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Uh uh, first, I want to thank you guys for your leadership over there at the airport. Uh, it sounds like you're doing the best you can to keep things on track, and I appreciated the phone conversation. My, my question is actually a little bit slightly off topic in that the, uh, the governor recently implemented his uh, voluntary quarantine, and I'm wondering, are there any logistical changes at the airport regarding that? I've had a couple people ask me if they're, when they return to Spokane, if anything is different now because of that voluntary uh, quarantine. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Capsart. Uh, the the short answer is um, <clears throat> no. Nothing that affects the the airport operationally. We have made sure that our airline partners are aware of the governor's travel advisory um, in order to make sure that passengers are informed when they are making travel plans, um, and we've featured that prominently on our website. Um, and, you know, in order to drive people to that that are looking for the most recent information uh, that they can, they can access regarding any kind of travel advisories in the state. Any other questions from anyone? Again, I appreciate you reaching out. I know um, a couple council members still are looking forward to meeting with you. And, um, but it's, it's great that you take that time to do it, which is easier to understand it. Um, all right. Thank you, thank uh, you. Council President. And uh, thank you to our council member partners. We really appreciate the strong support that we received from you and your partnership. Thank you, Dave and Larry. Uh, next, we have some recommended purchases by fleet operations for the wastewater department, and Mike Loudon is here to present those three uh, recommendations. Thank you, and good afternoon, council members. Uh, these three items are really two items. It's a tank truck and a service truck uh, to replace the aging vehicles that have over 10,000 hour piece on them. Uh, take trucks coming from Kenworth and Baldway Systems at $185,000, which is $15,000 under budget. And a service truck coming from Columbia Ford or Freightliner, respectively, at $142,000, which is almost $100,000 under budget. Thank you. 
Uh, any questions for Mike? Uh, next, we go to uh, two one-year contract renewals for fleet services, and David Payne is here to present this item. Good afternoon, Council President, Council members. The first item is um, to renew a contract with Raycom Services here in Spokane for backup support for radio, radio and upfitting primarily of police vehicles. Um, we use them for overflow when we can't handle all the work because the, the police vehicles typically come in within a very short period of time. It takes uh, anywhere from two to four weeks to condition those and put them out the door. That contract is for $150,000 to be used on an ad need basis. The next one is a renewal of the contract. No, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for our tire services with Goodyear Tire. Um, it, well, Tire Services, Wakefoot Commercial Tire Systems, which is the Goodyear dealer here in town. And this is for $150,000. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, next, we have the local area A&E professional services consultant agreements for non-federal aid projects for next year. And uh, Dan Buller from Engineering is here to present these uh, five proposed contracts. Good afternoon. Uh, items 4A through 4E are the proposed on-call contracts for local or state-funded projects uh, with consultants. With the consultants listed on your agenda sheet for specialty services, including geotechnical engineering, surveying, historic resources, and real estate services. Um, you saw something similar to this back in June for federal aid projects. Um, this is for local and state funded projects and next week by the way we expect to have one more similar agenda items for construction management consultant the consultants on your agenda sheets were selected by way of a request for qualifications process as outlined in and required by the rcws uh, work under these contracts supports design and construction of various public works projects and is repaid by each project utilizing both local and state funding, some of which is grant and some of which is loan. The proposed contracts are for two years with an optional one year renewal. Any questions I can answer? Thank you, Dan. Uh, next, we have a recommendation to list the Webster Building on the Spokane Register of Historic Places, and Megan Duvall is here to present this item. Good afternoon, everybody. I will share my screen here. Okay. Let me move through here really quick. Um, and as you know, the Spokane Register of Historic Places is our local program for listing properties. It is voluntary and does require the consent of the owner for listing. We protect our historic resources through the management agreement that you're looking at today. And uh, design review is only when a building permit is sought for a property, and this is how we offer incentives to property owners. We are in the middle of lots and lots of incentives, which is a good thing. So in order to be eligible for listing on the Spokane Register, a property has to be, uh, generally has to be 50 years or older. It can be historically significant uh, based on any of the criteria that we have in our ordinance. We can list building sites, district structures, or objects. Category A uh, deals with broad patterns of Spokane's history, and that's actually what the Webster building is uh, being considered under today. Category B is an association with a significant person. Category C deals with its architecture. D is prehistory or archeology. span And then finally, category E is cultural heritage. So the Webster building, resting on a brick and concrete foundation at 415 West Sprague, the two-story Webster building was constructed in 1893 as an unreinforced brick building with stores on the ground floor and single room occupancy hotel above. Its construction after the devastating 1889 fire, unfortunately, also coincided with the economic panic of 1893 and subsequent depression, one that left almost a five-year gap in Spokane's rebuilding efforts. 
The Webster Building is one of approximately 15 brick buildings built in the immediate post-fire era, which we consider to be that 1889 to 1893, before the panic hit, uh, that remain extant in downtown Spokane. It thus remains as a significant physical manifestation of the pivotal period in the Spokane's early development and uh, is eligible for listing on the Spokane Register of Historic Places under Category A. Edgar Webster was the building's developer. Um, Webster lived in Spokane in 1892, or he arrived in Spokane, sorry, in 1892, and quickly invested in Spokane real estate, buying property in the burgeoning downtown and outlying properties in both northeast and northwest quad quadrants of the city, properties that would become the Fairmont Memorial Park and Minnehaha Park. He became involved in Spokane affairs. School board meetings were held in his office building on Sprague. He was elected to the city freeholder committee that drafted the initial city charter and was an owner and president of the Ross Park Electric Railway Line. He made a fortune in real estate and mining and was one of Spokane's early millionaires. He died in 1939 after traveling the world and having many adventures. The spokesman remarked that he was one of the city's most widely traveled and picturesque citizens. The Webster Building nomination first was brought to the Historic Preservation Office in January of 2020. The building's exterior had recently been painted a dark blue color. So if you remember seeing the building being paint, that was painted dark blue um, not that long ago, um, and it also had these white exterior or these white tiles that were placed on the storefront level um, that you can see in this picture. Um, they were actually these interior tiles that were affixed to two cast iron columns on the primary facade. At the time, the nominations committee um, did conduct a site visit, and when they saw those changes combined with a lot of other changes to the front of the building, they basically said that, the build, it, that those changes had adversely affected the integrity to the point of it not being eligible for listing. And, um, basically left it at that and said that there were a couple things that the property owners could do in order to remedy that situation if they wanted to consider it for a listing. So the building has since been painted a more historically appropriate color and those tiles that were on the front have been removed and um, are no longer, uh, they actually put a brick veneer in place and painted it to match the rest of the building. So these are just some pictures of the uh, project as it was uh, before. So basically, really, it's a complete redo. The main level still looks like this. Um, I believe this was Herb's bar, and they've even jackhammered out the floors in the um, on the main level. So it's just awaiting a, a new tenant, and then they will do tenant improvements for that. So the Webster Building retains fair architectural integrity and original location design materials, workmanship, and association. The building has had extensive changes to the original windows as well as uh, the almost inevitable storefront changes, and a reconfiguration of the original single, single room occupancy use of the second floor into four short-term rental apartments. Even with these changes, the building does possess enough essential physical features to convey its historic identity. The Webster Building was reviewed by the Spokane Historic Landmarks Commission on October 21st and is eligible for listing on the Spokane Register of Historic Places under category A for its association with the frenzied construction period directly after the Great Fire. And that concludes my report. Council Member Stratton. This is just a really quick and probably silly question. Yeah. What is the definition of short-term rental? Is that just for people that come to town for a couple weeks or something? It can be, you know, I think it's kind of an Airbnb type of a situation. So, yeah, it could either be like a couple nights or it, they're really well appointed. They're all two bedroom units and two bathrooms and they have big laundry rooms. Each of them have their own laundry rooms. So I think it could be more of like a, you know, a, a visiting doctor that's here for three months or something like that. But I'm not sure how, exactly how they're reaching them out. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Uh, next, we go to the uh, placeholder reports for uh, next week. The first is the report of the mayor on pending clients and payments, both with parks and libraries and, and uh, without parks and libraries. And uh, 
Lastly is the placeholder for city council meeting minutes, uh, and those dates will be filled in prior to next week's meeting. And next we go to the legislative session, and as the council can see, there are two proposed uh, reappointments for next week, one to the Spokane Airport Board and one to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. And from there, we go to the legislative agenda, and there are a number of proposed amendments to the comprehensive plan, and uh, Kevin Freebot, uh, I believe, is here to present those items to the council. Good afternoon. Kevin, the next nine items are yours. <laughs> I like to fill in a, a, uh, an agenda. So, um, good afternoon, council president, members of the council. I don't have a presentation for you today. We did brief on this last week, so I'm here if you have questions. Other than that, we're um, we're ready to go next week for the hearing. I, any uh, questions on any of those items for Kevin? I just had one thing. Um, I was talking to the. Uh, Clerk Fister, and she mentioned that probably we needed to relabel these as uh, hearings. And so I'm looking for a motion to take these ordinances 35972 through 35980 and set them as hearing two matters A through I. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Okay. Those are reset somewhat. And I turn it back to you, Mr. Armsby. Thank you, Council President. Next, we go to the first reading ordinances for next week. And the first is expanding a proposed expansion of the number of authorized golf course zones in Spokane. And Council Member Stratton is the uh, uh, council member sponsor and also presenter, uh, Councilwoman Stratton. So this is a um, ordinance we've been working on for a long time, and it involves, like what we did in the, um, the Hilliard area, it involves a um, golf cart um, usage in parts of West Central and um, Kendall Yards. We've been working on it. We've had the... Um, State parks folks, because we have the trail, we've talked to the state parks folks about signage. Um, we have maps um, of the the trail, and we have um, individuals in the neighborhood that have really requested it. Now, I also know that there's another project like this in Councilmember Kinnear's district, where there are a couple neighborhoods that want to put together um, these golf cart trails. and. Part of this was an answer to individuals in Kendall Yards and a couple in West Central that um, wanted to be able to get on a golf cart and um, drive down, you know, cruise down to the store, pick their stuff up and go right home. So um, more efficient, uh, it's not a vehicle, and they're much more comfortable um, getting around in their neighborhood, that means, than a, than a car. So that's what this is. I hope that explains it. Any questions? Indeed. Council Member Mum. Hi, Council Member Uh We had worked on this, what, maybe nine months ago, a year ago? I've given a bunch of feedback it's on the it's, Yeah. It's been almost a year, yes. And all of your comments with Brian McClatchy on safety um, were included in the ordinance. So one of them that I, I did review it, thank you for that. I really appreciate including also the other alternative vehicle that's not technically a golf cart, because as you know, golf carts are only made to work really on grass and, the, and those smaller um, pathways. They don't have the right tires and, and for all weather, but there are other kinds of vehicles that can and have more safety with the roll crush bar. And I did see that in there, thank you. Yes, I think and that's the point we defined that as well. I appreciate that. So the changes that I saw in there, Brian, the edits that were in there, um, all that new information, I was having a hard time discerning what is actually new, uh, uh, and maybe maybe that is was already in there, and I just had missed it before. So I'll, I'll loop back with Mr. McClatchy on the um, update that's in our that's, that's been filed, and then um, my other question: Did we have this at committee yet? Because I was trying to 
I, I rather reserve my discussion for that area. We, for did. we did, and it's been a while ago. And okay. so Ryan, if you're out there, do you have the date? We had a date. Okay, so it did, we did, but it was the original one. It was yes. The, okay. Yes. And there were a lot of questions, and so that's why we kind of pulled it and we've been working on it. I think the one that is probably the thing, the biggest question I have, and I can work with you guys offline on it, is when we're crossing over arterials, uh, I'm specifically thinking coming out of Kendall Yards over Broadway, um, because these vehicles don't have, you know, of course, like a regular car, airbags and that, that sort of thing. If there was an accident, um, are we requiring insurance for folks who are in these vehicles? Because they're not a vehicle, that, that was kind of my question. Ryan, do we have an answer on that? I didn't yeah, state law does require that the operator have insurance coverage. And that was something I wanted to maybe think if we wanted to put that in our code um, that, that or somehow alert folks, because some folks may just have a, a kind of golf cart that they use, you know, for golfing and may not realize it has to have that kind of road insurance for liability. <laughs> I don't believe that we, um, I will verify to see whether we need to incorporate that section of state code. Okay, Brian, if you want me to find my old notes, I might be able to dig them up because I think I had a bunch of stuff like that in there for you. That'd be great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm, Any other questions? And we've moved to the next item then, which is the proposed imposition of a sales and use tax for construction uh, and rehabilitation of attainable housing. And uh, the council sponsors are uh, Wilkerson, Stratton and Burke and Brian McClatchy, uh, the uh, director of policy for the council is here to present this item. Good evening council or afternoon. Uh, it gets dark early, so I get confused about what time it is anymore. Um, I think you just had a presentation about this in your finance committee meeting. Um, this is uh, the result of House Bill 1590, which allows uh, cities to impose an additional one-tenth of one percent sales tax for the construction and acquisition of affordable housing. And uh, this ordinance creates some framework around how that can happen. And uh, happy to answer any questions. Again, I. I believe this was just presented in your finance committee today. Okay. Not um, seeing any questions, I'll move to the next group of ordinances. And it relates to various design standards and street development standards. Uh, and there are four items here and uh, Inga Note is here to present these items. Um, Inga. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Council and Council President, I'm going to share my screen here and I've just got um, just kind of 10 summary slides just to go over quickly what where we've come and what all we're updating. So um, this is the schedule that we've gone through. We um, have this on the agenda for a first reading on the 23rd and then the hearing on the 30th of November. This is the final version of the table that outlines our target values for street dimensions, including the sidewalks, the buffers, um, swales, parking lanes, bicycle lanes, um, and vehicle lanes. One of the, the other more significant changes, and this is in the, the municipal code that goes with it, is that we are updating how we determine what our arterial right-of-way widths should be and going rather than by whether it's a principal arterial or a collector, we will look at whether it's meant to have two lanes or three lanes, four or five in the future and use that to guide what the arterial right-of-way width should be. We're also looking at adjusting our, our standard street width. So setting our residential standard for low density to 32 feet. And this is in areas where we have usually street facing garages and driveways. And then for the other areas where we may have um, more on street parking, we stick with 36 feet. And that's outlined in this table here. We've also, um, another significant change is just that we're going to work towards having two ramps 
at every corner whenever we're doing any kind of full reconstruction project. And then if it's retrofit or preservation work, we'll, we'll try as best we can to fit it in, um, recognizing that sometimes we have constraints that uh, prevent us from doing both. And another fairly major change on the design end is that instead of using a fixed corner radius now, we're going to actually run our design vehicles through the intersection using our auto turn um, design program and design the street for smaller vehicles, but make sure they can still accommodate the bigger trucks and fire equipment by going outside of their lane a little bit. So these are the, the sections of municipal code that are being updated along with it. So you should find four ordinances in the packet. Um, that would be these three, and then the adoption ordinance for the actual street standards, which are also in the packet. So that's all I have. Do you have any questions for me? No. And just for anyone watching. I'm not she, seeing she, any questions. I would uh, move to the final uh, proposed ordinance in this section, and that relates to an amendment for uh, parks. And uh, Giacobbe Berg uh, with Councilman Kinnear's office is here to present this item. I'm not sure he is. I don't see him. Um, Mary Miramatsu is here. And I believe um, Garrett Jones, but perhaps not. We did brief this um, just a few minutes ago in committee. So I guess at this point, uh, we would ask if, if council has questions or more questions that Mary could answer for you. I had a, I had a question for you, Mary. Um, there's a provision, there's two provisions that talk about drug paraphernalia, which I believe are already illegal under the city code and state law. And so I'm just wondering, do we get anything extra legally by restating it in a park section? Yes, council president, thank you for the question. I think it's a great question. Um, and it's one that we looked at initially to determine, is it really necessary to put these two provisions in the municipal code? And then after really examining the unique nature of parks, the decision was made to basically restate what's already in state law and in the municipal code, but to add provisions that make this unique to parks. So let me turn to one provision in particular. I don't know if you have it in front of you. Maybe if I can share my screen, perhaps I can walk you through that. Let me see if I can find the, the right provision. I think this is the one. Let me see. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Oh, yeah. perfect. Okay. So I'm going to turn up to the portion under drugs and alcohol. And there's two provisions that are added here, a uh, paragraph three and four. So paragraph three states, it is unlawful for any person in or adjacent to a city park, including in parked vehicles or on sidewalks on both sides of the adjacent street to use drug paraphernalia in violation of 6954.12 in Spokane Municipal Code 1015A020 and a violation of this section is a misdemeanor. So what you see in this is a restatement of the law, but it also adds the fact that at parks, we see vehicles that are parked along the city streets at the park specifically for purposes of using drug paraphernalia. That activity is illegal, but there's no recognition in state law that it occurs at a city park, including in vehicles and on sidewalks on the street sides. Why is this important? The park rangers, the police department, they've all told us that that's what they see. It's not just merely on the turf in the park, but it's actually in those locations. We thought we would put the public on notice of that, that it just doesn't have to be in the actual park, but it has to affect the park. It has to be in those areas that are buffer zones adjacent to and surrounding the park. On paragraph four, 
again, this is a restatement of the law. No person may distribute, sell, give, et cetera, drug paraphernalia, hypodermic needles, syringes, et cetera. But what this does is it adds the park exclusion as an intermediate sanction. So it's already a class one civil infraction, but now we've added that violators may be subject to the exclusionary process that the Parks Department has had in place for several years. And that just creates an intermediate sanction. A person doesn't have to be cited with a civil infraction immediately, but it gives that additional notice to the public of what the expectation is in the park. Are there any questions on that? Um, does that help, Council President? Yeah, it, well, I have more questions, as you might imagine. Okay. Uh, but Absolutely. So just to be clear, uh, all of the things that are listed in three and four are already illegal, whether in the park or on the sidewalk on the other side of the street. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Yes. So I'm wondering if rather than having the language in three and four just specifying a particular crime, we could just say that any crimes committed in parks are illegal and can uh, subject the violator to exclusion from one or more city parks for one year, rather than just focusing on one offense and not the others, because I think most people want all the laws uh, enforced, and I'm just worried that we're going to clog, clog up our city code with individual restatements at parks and, and maybe schools and all these things when it already is illegal. So, But I, I do agree with you that we need to put people on notice that in addition to any criminal mm -hmm. sanction or civil infraction, that the parks can also exclude them for the type of conduct that's disruptive. So is there, I guess I'm just wondering your response to that. It's a fair comment, and I see your point, and I think that's, that's a good observation to have. One of the reasons why we thought this was important is because these are two particular offenses that are seen in great abundance in these parks. So, yeah, well, technically people do commit a variety of crimes in the city parks. These are two that were called out by park rangers as being tremendously um, frequent. So these are kind of the frequent flyer type of senses that they thought if we can clearly designate them as park rule violations, then we give our park rangers who are limited commissioned officers the authority and the clear, you know, we put the public on notice that these are things that are not just violations under the general set of rules and laws, but people know that the park rangers have the authority to take action with regard to these particular offenses. They're already illegal but they are adverse, adversely affecting our parks. And so the neighborhoods, um, and, and this is what we saw recently, is that in Brown's edition and at least one other park, that neighborhoods, people within the city blocks surrounding uh, particular parks, were having to actually go through and pick up uh, needles. And, and they saw the adverse impacts of drug use. They see the people parked along the streets. And so from an enforcement perspective, it was looked at as particularly urgent to try to address this type of thing in a way that is meaningful. So this was the proposal. I do appreciate that question. Yep. Thank you. You bet. Council President. Yes, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I would just add, I, I, I've heard from numerous constituents that, you know, they're, they're fearful, in fact, of going into the parks because of, of the potential of stepping on a needle or having a needle sitting on something that they might place their hand on. And so anything we can do to make it a priority that, that those needles are not appearing in our parks to me should be definitely something that we pursue. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Council President? Yes, Council Member Wilkerson. Not opposed to the ordinance, and this is, can't be answered here, but I would like to know how, when it passes, how soon the parks would have this posted in all of our parks. So that immediate signage going up. Yeah, uh, Council Member Wilkerson, that's a great question. Um, just as soon as the ordinance takes effect, so 30 days after signature from the mayor uh, after passage of the ordinance, 
they would immediately place signage so that everybody is on notice. Anybody else? Any, any additional questions? Thank you, Mary. Uh, next, we move to special considerations. And uh, the, the, the only item there is the proposed purchase by fleet operations uh, for the police department. And I think this is an item that has been uh, discussed numerous times over uh, the last few weeks. And I don't see Eric present, but if council members have any questions or additional issues, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know and I will get Eric or someone from the police department in contact with you. Councilmember Kinnear. Councilwoman Kinnear. I don't know that we actually resolved anything. Mm -mm. So, Council President, am I? No. I think, you know, what we were waiting for in the past was the life cycle cost of the electric vehicles versus the gasoline or hybrid. We did get that report last week and it showed that the electric vehicles were quite a bit cheaper. And then there was a question of the suitability of the electric vehicles. And I think that's what we're waiting for because several police departments are using the electrical vehicles as pursuit vehicles. Um, and we haven't really gotten a presentation on why that wouldn't work. So, um, so we have not resolved it yet, but... Per, so it's, it, it's but my it, understanding. It is on the PIES agenda. Pushback. It is on the PIES yes. agenda. We, yeah. we got pushback, as I recall, based on um, the charging stations, where they should be, how many. That seemed to be the barrier, and it was kind of cart before the horse because if you don't have charging stations, you can't have the vehicles. But if you don't have the vehicles, why would you put it in the charging station? So it's the perfect conundrum. And I think we really need to get some answers because it's something we want to pursue as a council. We've talked about it and maybe make it as a pilot, um, see how it works. Yep. And I, I'm going to call on you, Mr. Payne, in the, but I just wanted to mention that there were two things. One was the chargers and then how that would become operational. And as you said, we're going to have to figure that out because all vehicles are going towards electrical, so we have to figure that out. But there was also a concern about whether they could be outfitted as a patrol car, I think. But I see Mr. Payne has his hand raised, so please tell us what's going on, David. Uh, yes, and I apologize, Council. I, <clears throat> I just came back off vacation last week, and you guys had many discussions about this. Um, as of Friday, um, Nathan Grow, our fleet analyst, and myself on the SPD, we put together a list of questions. And Nathan has started today reaching out to all the SPDs that we know of that have electric vehicles in service with a list of specific questions to address your, your questions as best, we, as best we can. And one of them is fit. Um, and the other is, you know, one of the major ones is, is fit of equipment, um, how they're charging them, where they're charging them. And then also, what portions of the police department are actually using these, and are they using them as pursuit vehicles? Um, two of the vehicles that are, that are up for approval are actual pursuit vehicles that are going to go into the rotation for the patrol officers. Mm -hmm. The other two, the Tahoes, um, I, I don't know their specific use at this point. But we're hoping by Friday um, to have all that information gathered up for the PIES committee, as Ms. Kinnear um, had mentioned. Great. That, we're really looking forward to that. Thanks um, for mobilizing. And I'm glad you went on vacation. So we, 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 that's good. Yeah. I went to Arizona. It was, we broke a record, 98 degrees. I, I'm okay. not moving to Arizona. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else Thanks, on, David. on this matter? Okay. And then the, the final uh, item on the agenda is hearings. And Paul and Josie was not able to get on to the call, but he is, is monitoring the call and indicated that he is available should any council members have any issues that are raised with you or have any questions. And this is just to underscore that the public hearing is being continued 
from November 9th uh, and will continue until November 30th for uh, people that want to provide input uh, on the uh, budget for next year. And just, just by way of update, since I have the council members on, is uh, Tim Donovan has put together some materials uh, attempting to summarize changes from the mayor's latest uh, budget, and he's going to he shared that with our budget uh, working group, which is Councilmember Mum, Kinnear, myself, and we're going to meet this week and talk about it and analyze it, and then get back to you with our thoughts on it. So we're we kind of took a week off doing that, but we'll get back at it, and um, we're still looking to pass a budget on time. Um, probably in early uh, to mid-December, no later than the 14th at this point. So, okay. Great. Um, council President and members of the Council, that includes the advance agenda for the meeting on November 23rd. All right. Is there a motion to adopt it as uh, amended, putting all those um, uh, comp plan amendments into hearing instead of ordinances? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. That agenda is adopted. We are now moving into our legislative session for today that we moved from six o'clock. There was no consent agenda. There's two, oh, there is yeah, two things, right. sorry. There's a very short consent agenda. If um, Madam Clerk would read the consent agenda. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through November 6, 2020. Total $6,168,081.41 with Parks and Library claims approved with respect to boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $5,651,882.11. Number two, City Council meeting minutes for November 2nd, 2020. All right. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda as read, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, that is adopted. And we have a couple of appointments. Okay. Appointment of Thomas Sanderson as the PCTS representative to the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board for a term ending November 11, 2021. Reappointment of Tom Morgan as the District 1 representative to the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board for a term of November 14, 2020 through November 11, 2022 an appointment of Luke Jasmine as the District 1 representative to the Office of the Police Ombudsman Commission for a term ending September 14, 2023. Any discussion about the appointments? Seeing and hearing none. Oh, Councilmember Burke. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say maybe that we should have um, a little bit more clear of a process of how to do the district. Uh, Voting because um, this took this took me about five months. So um, if there's any write up or anything that we can get or a person that we contact, that would probably be really helpful. That yep, uh, Hanley Aller says she has now figured it out, so it will go much easier in the future. So uh, you get you didn't just get a new council president; you got a new assistant to the council president. So. Uh, but we have that, and um, I also, just while you're on that, uh, Ms. Allers also did a lot of research on the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board, which, as you know, was uh, dormant because of a, a voter initiative that was eventually struck down, and um, she and Shauna Harshman, um, one of our initiatives managers, is working on the CTAB and uh, updating it, and there were some conflicting resolutions of terms and term limits, and uh, this will get us uh, back up to speed, but you'll be seeing some work from us in the future on that as well. So, Council Member Burt. Sorry, one more thing. I just wanted to say, uh, by no means was I uh, being uh, trying to be rude to Hanley or yeah. you. I, 
uh, I feel like, you know, as a council member, I didn't know the process and that just took so long. So I appreciate both of you guys for really uh, working on this and trying to drill down where to go because um, I was absolutely lost. <laughs> yep. No, we didn't take it personally. We we're just explaining. But it is the uh, – actually, both these – Appointments, both the ombudsman and the district representative for the CTAB are the exception to the rule of the mayor appointing. And so it's really only council appointing because it's district. So it's, it's actually kind of rare. But yes, appreciate that. All right, all those in favor? Oh, Councilmember Cathcart. Yes. Sorry, I was just going to thank uh, Councilman Burke for, for bird dogging this and, and uh, seeing it through to the end. It, uh, seeing the emails back and forth, it, it was definitely a, a frustrating. Uh, uh, issue, but, but glad we got it taken care of and are able to get these folks appointed. Yep, great. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, abstentions. All right, thank you for your service. And again, for the ones that are council appointments, uh, Ms. Allers has already drafted their emails informing them, and we'll be sending that out later tonight. So great. And then that brings us to first reading ordinances. Okay. Ordinance C35972 relating to the application file C19499 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to general commercial for approximately 0.85 acres located at 3001, 3001. 3011 and 3027 East Liberty Avenue, parcels 3503.1304.1305 and 0.1306 and amending the zoning map from residential single family to general commercial. By a vote of 9 to 0, the plan commission recommends approval. Ordinance C35973 relating to the application file Z19501 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to general commercial for approximately 0.51 acres located at 6204 Nevada Street and 1015 East Decatur Avenue, parcels 36321.0209 and 0 0.010 and amending the zoning map from residential single family to community business by a vote of 9 to 0, the plan commission recommends denial. Ordinance C35974 relating to application file Z19-502 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to office for approximately 0.61 acres located at 3207 and 3203 East 29th Avenue and 2820 and 2826 South Ray Street parcels 35273.0219, 0 0.0220, 0 0.0305 and 0 0.0306 and amending the zoning map from residential single family to office. By vote of 9 to 0, the Plan Commission recommends approval of parcels 35273.0305 and 0 0.0306 and denial of parcels 35273.0219 and 0.220. Ordinance C35975 relating to application file Z19503 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to residential 1530 for approximately 10.3 acres located at 3227 East 53rd Avenue and 5106 South Plus Highway, parcels 3403, 2.9044, 0.9093, 0.9094, and amending the zoning map from residential single family to residential multifamily. By a vote of eight to one, the plan commission recommends approval. Ordinance C35976 relating to application file Z19504 comp amending map LU1 land use plan, plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to residential 1530 for approximately 2.2 acres located at 3004 West 8th Avenue, parcels 25234.0902 and 0 0.06501 and amending the zoning map from residential single family to residential multifamily. By a vote of 9 to 0, the Plan Commission recommends approval. Ordinance C35977 related application file Z19505 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to residential 1530 for approximately 0.16 acres. Located at 1117 West 10th Avenue, parcel 35. Point 35193.1405 and amending the zoning map from residential single family to residential multifamily by a vote of 7 to 0 and 1 abstention the plan commission recommends denial Ordinance C35978 relating to proposal files Z20-019 comp amending comprehensive plan map TR5 proposed bike network map in various locations and amending the text of appendix D to the comprehensive plan to update terminology 
related to protecting bike lanes and to update map references by a vote of eight to zero, the plan commission recommends approval. Ordinance C35979 relating to proposal file Z20042 comp amending comprehensive plan map TR12 arterial network map and various locations throughout the city together with corresponding changes to the official arterial street map in Spokane Municipal Code 12.08.040, by a vote of 9 to 0, the Plan Commission recommends approval. And to Ordinance C35980 relating to proposal file Z20045 comp amending the text of Chapter 4, Transportation of the Comprehensive Plan to discuss safety needs for at grade railroad crossings, by a vote of 9 to 0, the Plan Commission recommends approval. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. All right. Well, as usual, an excellent job reading. And if it takes that long to read, you can just imagine how busy our staff has been in the last year and our planning commission members uh, getting ready to make these really important um, proposed changes. So thanks to everyone for that work. We'll have uh, you know quite an extensive meeting next week to go over those in uh, detail and let the public um, weigh in on it. And I also um, was just noting in... Several parts of the agenda where it says open forum is uh, not available now. Um, Ms. Allers is working on the proposal to start up open forum in a limited basis, and she'll have something in writing hopefully in the next week or so that we can all review and see if we can start doing that virtually for um, 30 minutes at our council meetings um, soon. With that, everybody, please uh, stay healthy and take care of yourself, and thank you all for your service. We're adjourned.